Well, welcome for the uh, last seminar uh, in this year, in 2011. And I'm very happy that we managed to uh, get uh, Professor Manfred Stede uh, to <coughs> present a talk in Fred Jelinek's series of lectures. Uh, Manfred is from University of Potsdam, and um, uh, actually uh, we um, made our context uh, through his work on discourse analysis, and we had some nice discussions at the workshop, which was last year uh, in Birmingham, and uh, then we said, okay, why not to come to Prague? And Manfred, fortunately, was free, at least for one Monday <laughs> in the winter, in the winter term. And he proposed uh, a topic which is more general than what we have been discussing so far, but m maybe uh, even more interesting for um, a wider range of people in this audience. So uh, today he will talk. He will talk on opinion mining and uh, issues that uh, are related to uh, text. Uh, passing. Uh, so I again would like to say that we are very happy that you could accept our invitation and now please take the floor. Thank you very much for the kind introduction for the invitation to come here. I'm very pleased to have the chance to talk to you. Um, the talk will be in two parts actually. The first one is reporting on work we did at Potsdam and then later on with colleagues in Vancouver and Canada on opinion mining on both sentences and text. And then the second part will be more tentative in nature, where I report an ongoing work, where there's some intermediate results here and there, but that's more a roadmap than a finished product talk. So it's really two different parts. As for opinion mining, we started working on this topic in 2000, and oops, the gray is a bit weak, unfortunately. The sources are always in gray down there. But I guess you can see that. So that's a master's thesis written in Potsdam in 2006 where we started working on opinion mining on an interesting genre of text, namely students' evaluations of their classes, where they're being asked to rate instructors and atmosphere and what have you. And one fairly silly question on that questionnaire was, with this course, what did you like and what did you dislike? So students answered stuff like this. And then if you have several hundred of these answers, you don't want to analyze them all individually. Where's the nice thing? Where's the bad thing? So this master's student in computer science said, hey, it should be possible to take these sentences, tear them apart, and figure out where are the positive judgments and where are the negative judgments. And that's the standard classical opinion mining task that we all know uh, today in different domains, of course. This is in a very non-practical, non-industrial domain, but it was a start to figure out that this is positive in green and negative in red. The methods he used at the time was chunking the sentence and clause splitting, no deep syntactic parsing, rather superficial noun phrase chunking and identifying clause boundaries. Then given a list of words, figure out where are the positive and negative words in these parts of sentences, and then have some rules for negations, amplifiers, and downtoners, and I will present some examples on how that works more seriously in about eight minutes, I guess. So that was the first contact with opinion mining in 2006. A little bit later, we had a project on text summarization. And one aspect there was multi-document summarization of film reviews. Film reviews was a genre that we spent a lot of time on. The idea being you have, say, seven different reviews of the same movie, and you want to be able to collect them all, get the information out of the individual reviews, and fuse them into a single coherent document that is not redundant, has all the important information, and if possible, even summarizes the positive and negative comments that the reviewers make on the movie. So one aspect of this is to take the text, the document, as it comes from HTML sites, and first of all, chunk it into functional units or stages, as they are called in some version of discourse linguistics. So we have stages that describe the content of the movie or that comment on the content of the movie 
or do both sometimes in our German data. A good feature was that describe and comment was usually kept very nicely distinct. There was a paragraph describing the plot and some comment and some more description, more description, more comment, but very little intermixing um, describing and comment in the same paragraph. Sometimes it happens, so there is a stage that mixes the two. Then there is rare things like quoting, background information, interpretation, and then all sorts of formal content zones or stages which give um, the title of the movie, the runtime, and all sorts of other things that you just have to identify once and then present in the review, in the collected review once, but you don't want to repeat these things. So the first task basically is to take the document as a whole and break it down into these individual portions that play different functional roles for the whole document. And one subtask is then to distinguish between those paragraphs that just describe what's going on in the movie. The architect arrives in Rome, we're an exhibition, under crack supervision, the city doesn't sit with him. That's a description of the plot or the beginning of the plot. Whereas over here we have a classical commentary paragraph. Greenaway has an eye for composition, it's the director, Greenaway. And in the belly of an architect, many formal arrangements stand out for their beauty. Dennehy is a actor, is slightly illegible, and so on and so forth. So here we get opinion on how the movie works and how well it's being acted, and so on. And figuring out this distinction then is very important for multi-document summarization. If we want the story only once in the fused summary, and maybe the different pieces of opinion nicely separated and arranged. The way we did this particular, we attacked this particular problem was a plain statistical bag of terms approach. So we did supervised learning using support vector machines. Um, we were working on German text at the time, using 100 reviews from different internet sites. Training test set then included new internet sites, that means that these five, it's not just all user-generated content, where on some blog somebody says, oh, I didn't like this movie because um, the source documents are all from respectable review sites where these things are being published on a regular basis and you can trust the structure and the content. So we took five of these sites for developing and then three more for testing. And the features that turn out to be best for this plain bag of terms approach is character five grams. So we didn't do words or stamps or lemmas, but just a window of characters moved across the text. And uh, there was one paper dis dif dis comparing the different term definitions and this turned out to be the most successful. The results you can see there is around 80% precision recall, which is for this kind of task is quite respectable. That was in 2007 we published these results and then about a year later started collaborating with these people in Vancouver, Maite Tabwada and her group in the uh, Computer Science Department, English Department in Vancouver at Simon Fraser University. And now, so we started working on English text as well, not just German, did some manual annotation and a study that figured out inter-annotator agreement for this distinction between comment and description in comparison to the mixture of describe and comment and in comparison to the formal zones which is just runtime, director, the key information about the movie and uh, various classification tasks all led to fairly respectable kappa except maybe for the describe and comment versus these two that's a bit lower but it on the whole says that the task is tractable. Then one annotator came up with an annotation for a more complex corpus of 100 texts from rottentomatoes.com. So that's for now from one internet site in English. And we started classification experiments using features like, again, our character 5 grams, which proved useful in the earlier work. And then some genre-based features we borrowed from Douglas Biber's book, these things. Also connectives or discourse markers for contrast, comparison, cause, or evidence. Then a list of words indicating opinion or appreciation, judgment, appraisal in a general sense. And we'll come to that in a few minutes. And some text statistics, length of words and sentences, position of the paragraph and the text to figure out this distinction between describe and comment. And I'm not going into detail here. There was a whole range of different classifiers being tried out in various settings, 
on the whole, the results were a bit worse than we had for the German data. And the reason, I think, is that RottenTomatoes.com is as a source, not as nicely structured. The language is sometimes more user-generated content-like, so not as easy to process and to analyze. So accuracy, these are, for the various classifiers, the best results, 71, 78, or 69. But um, that led us then to a more intensive collaboration on an opinion mining program called SOCAL, which stands for Semantic Orientation Calculator. Semantic orientation means the sentiment expressed in a text. Is the text leaning towards a positive judgment or a negative judgment, like we had seen with sentences in the very beginning, now applied to whole texts? We deliberately chose to try a lexicon-based approach, so not just corpus learning, uh, supervised learning, but really based on declarative lexicon for reasons that I hope will become clear in the next, say, 15 minutes. Earlier research in this vein has largely concentrated on adjectives, but notice that you can have sentiment or effect encoded in other words just as well. So strolled purposefully through its neighborhood. We have positively connotated words here, but negatively connotated words like strutted, cockily, turf, despite the propositional content being pretty much the same in these two variants. So there's a positive and a negative formulation of the same state of affairs. In the end, the dictionary contained, yes, very many adjectives. That's still the most important group for this kind of work. But 50% of the adjectives also is the number of nouns that we encoded. And then there are some verbs and several adverbs in parentheses because adjectives, nouns, and verbs were collected from these sources, 500 movie and other reviews from eight different product categories. So we tried to be balanced for products like computers and movies and household gadgets, um, and was also then extended with words we found in the General Inquirer Dictionary, one of the first sentiment dictionaries that were published in the 1960s. And we ranked all these words on a scale ranging from minus 5 to plus 5. Like you see over here, monstrosity is pretty negative, masterpiece is pretty positive, and many things in between. So you may ask, wow, this ranking, I mean, come on, that's very subjective. How do you objectify that, and I will mention that also later on. Why are the adverbs in parentheses? Because they were derived from other words automatically to a large extent. So these were collected manually, and then the adverbs were derived. One problem with this kind of work is that you encounter ambiguity for opinion-loaded words. So some extent that's being resolved with part of speech tagging. So the plot is a neutral noun in the movie review business, but as a verb, to plot against somebody is pretty negative. There, part of speech makes a distinction. Novel is similar, right? The adjective is positive, the noun is pretty neutral. Um, other word sense ambiguity we didn't address. So if you have a noun with multiple senses and different connotations, we didn't address that. When there was connotation ambiguity in this sense, the teacher inspired her students to pursue their dreams. We were inspired as a positive thing. This movie was inspired by true events. We just did some averaging. So the annotators would look at different instances of inspire, see it's pretty positive here, pretty neutral here. And in the end, we averaged over the various readings found in the corpus. And that was then the entry in the dictionary. In terms of derivation, certain nouns can be compiled from the verb dictionary, like exaggeration comes from exaggerate. But interestingly, the strength can change. That was a general tendency that the native speakers in Canada observed, that when you go from the verb to the noun, especially with the negative verbs, the negativity tends to increase. Things get worse when you go to the noun. Complicate is so-so. Complication sounds pretty serious. Yeah? So there's a Hypothesis not really proven yet, but what we found is that possibly there's a general trend that this derivation adds to the negativity that's already in the verb. As I said earlier, the adverbs are also being derived from other words, namely from the adjectives, by matching the suffix at the end. And sometimes, again, the value needs to be corrected, like essential and essentially have different connotations, so at that point we had to 
adjust the values. And there's just some examples from the adverb dictionary. Okay, so then one clear question is what's the coverage of this dictionary? How many interesting words do we cover there? And that's not so easy to measure because we don't have the master lexicon that we can just compare to one Maybe master lexicon or comparable effort is the word list by Teresa Wilson and others from 2005. They have 8,000 words. It's a bit more than in so-called. We had about 5,000. But if you look into this list, then you find quite a few mutual words in there, repetitions, related entries, whereas our lexicon concentrates really on the non-mutual things and tries to avoid repetition. So in that sense, I think the coverage is pretty similar between so-called and the Wilson et al list. However, as stated down there, maybe the best argument really is if you move your lexicon from one domain where you used it and trained it and you're happy with it to a new domain and it still performs in a respectable way, then the coverage seems to be not all that bad. So maybe such a practical criterion is more informative than comparing it to other lists. By the way, there are many word lists compiled automatically by crawling websites and trying to compile big subjectivity lexicons, and they have many more entries than these, uh, but then with, again, much more noise, of course, whereas our dictionary really tries to be on the high quality end of the scale. Right, when the words are there, we have to worry about modification of words in context. A positive word doesn't have to stay positive when used in a sentence. There is intensification, you can have amplifiers or downtoners, that was noted by other researchers pretty early, actually, and one approaches to add and subtract values. So if you have a positive adjective like nice, and then you add very nice, so you add plus three to the whole composition, and there's your result. However, we found that that's not always a good approach because the intensification really sometimes depends on the word that you do modify. Very something is not always the same as very something else. And that's why we opted for a nonlinear um, approach to add percentages of the value that you had before. So it slightly will decrease the value you had by minus 50%, whereas extraordinary will add 50% and then stuff in between. Really very good. If good has a value of 3 in the lexicon, then it's computed like this. You take 3, add the 125% from very, add the 115% from really, and you end up with 4.3. That's the way intensification is being handled. One result is that an intensifier like really in this approach can modify not just adjectives but also adverbs and verbs in contrast to other work that really concentrates on the adjectives. And we have 177 intensifiers in total. Second problem of context, of course, is negation, what happens when you deny something, the acting was not very good, then you find good in your dictionary, you have the three, I think, was the value, but of course, you don't want three, and you don't want 4.2, because it's very good, but then not very good. The first problem is to find the negation operators. Sometimes they are pretty close to the adjective they modify, that's very nice, but sometimes they appear at long distance, nobody gives a good performance in this movie, you can't really always stop at the determiner and think, well, if here's my positive adjective, then I just look for the previous determiner and that's it. No, you have to look further backwards and encounter the nobody. So our strategy is to look backwards until you reach a clause boundary, which is heuristically determined by being a punctuation symbol or a sentential connective. And I don't think will this, be a pro this will be a problem, can be handled by finding problem, going all the way back to punctuation and then you encounter the don't negator along the way. So finding them is one thing, and then what to do about the value change is the other question of negation handling. One popular approach is polarity flipping. Take the word, find the negation, flip the polarity of the verb, plus four becomes minus four, and that's it. Again, we found some problems with this approach. If excellent is top and atrocious, it at the opposite end. You can't label anything worse than atrocious, I guess, in English. Then excellent and not excellent shouldn't really be polarity flipped. I mean, this is not minus five. This is not really great, but certainly not bad and definitely not atrocious. 
So the simple polarity flipping we found has to be reconsidered, and we use a polarity shift rather than a flipping of the sign. She's not terrific, but not terrible either. Then becomes five for terrific, four for the negation is one, and not terrible results in minus one. Similar, it's not a spectacular film. And the third and final problem of context is what we call irrealis blocking. So we have negation, intensification, and these irrealis markers. For kids, this movie could be one of the best of the holiday season. You see the best, you think it's plus five, but then, whoops, there's a could in here, so better be careful. And these are in the family of irrealis markers. I thought this movie would be as good as The Grinch, but unfortunately it wasn't. You better don't count this as plus four, because there's a good in there. Our implementation tries to locate these irrealis markers and then figure out whether the positive or negative word is in the scope of this marker, where scope is heuristically determined. We don't do full parsing, I mentioned that. So we only have windows of words to consider. And the irrealis markers are models, conditionality. If this is a good movie, then we don't want to count the good. Negative polarity items questions, material in quotes, quotations don't usually express the opinion of the author or certain verbs that mark non-reality. So this should have been a great movie. We encounter great. We think it's three, but we also find the realis marker and it just cancels out that thing. So the end result for this sentence is then zero. Finally, there are some text level features encoded, basically these two. <coughs> One observation is that negativity is kind of marked in reviews, or maybe generally in stating opinions. People tend not to be as negative as, on the other hand, they say positive things. So, in general, positive reviews are easier to recognize than negative reviews, because negativity is less explicit. We are more polite when being negative, and therefore, um, if we have a negative result at the end for the text, we increase it by 50% because the assumption is that negativity is really more than what is visible on the surface. That's just an observation from discourse studies. The other thing is word repetition. I saw great acting, a great plot, and a great ending. Okay, that's certainly a nice opinion, but maybe it's not as great as three times great because this repetition indicates, okay, to some extent, I got bored when moving from this thing to that thing and to that thing. So we, owe, uh, we take the original value of the word and then divide it. The, what's the mathematical word? Kehrwert. Sorry, I know the English word, but you see what I mean. Um, so this would only be one half, and that's one third of its original value. Evaluation. So was it worth it to do all this complicated lexicon build-up. The movie reviewers have the advantage they come with an overall judgment at the end. They're either, either positive or negative, and we can correlate this with whether so-called gives us a positive or a negative result, larger than zero or less than zero. And we evaluated four variants of the approach, the full so-called, as I just described it, a simple version that follows ideas from Polanyi and Zen in 06, where you have only two and minus two as values in a dictionary, and only this kind of intensification, so it's a more modest variant. Um, only adjective has no words or adjectives in the lexicon, and one word ignores all the multi-word expressions, which are also, to some extent, in the lexicon. There's about 130 uh, multi-word verbs. What happens is that the full lexicon is best all the time, but it beats the other ones to various degrees. For instance, the difference between one word and full is not very noticeable. But sometimes it even gets worse here. It stays the same. Slight increase, slight increase, slight increase. But uh, that feature seems not to be very important. However, the difference to the simple version or to the only adjective version is very noticeable, and those marked with an asterisk are, in fact, statistically significant. So the conclusion is that overall, doing this more complicated approach seems to pay off at the end. Evaluating then the whole approach on two different subcorpora and across 
eight different domains gives accuracies in this range and in that range, which is pretty much state of the art. I would say you see it varies to some extent. The cookware is kind of difficult to handle. The cars and the computers are the easiest for some reason. Um, and what I said earlier, that uh, positive reviews are easier to recognize than negative reviews. That's visible across the board, except here. You see that the negatives usually have lower results. Not always. Here's an exception. But usually negative is more difficult to get than the positive. Okay, interim summary for this part of the talk. What was so-called all about? It's sentiment detection using a hand-built lexicon, which obviously is more expensive to create than to automatically harvest all the words and do it on a large scale with automatic collection. Um, second point is you need to validate the prior polarities, the plus threes, minus fours that we put into the lexicon, and we did this via Amazon Turk. The colleagues in Vancouver did that, so I didn't talk about it now because it's a totally different exercise. The first values were uh, produced by a team of three local annotators in Vancouver, and then Amazon Turk was used to verify that the settings were, in fact, shared by as many speakers as possible. One advantage of doing this in the handbill lexicon fashion is that it can be systematically fused now with negation, intensification, and this aerialis blocking problem. So you can do these systematic calculations of semantic orientation in context. And it is relatively robust against a domain switch, which is much more difficult with any automatically harvested dictionary where you take, I don't know, computer science papers and look at all the positive and negative words and then try to carry that lexicon over to cars or cookware. Also, one perspective is to extend this general purpose sentiment lexicon then with domain-specific sub-lexicons, because in certain domains, certain adjectives all of a sudden become opinion-loaded. Um, a smartphone with small keys, for instance, might be negative if the keys are getting too small, whereas small in general is not a negative feature. So the general lexicon can be extended from domain to domain with words that are important only in, yeah, that subdomain. Getting then back to the describe versus comment problem, our Peter Greenaway, Belly of an Architect movie. This was the description. That was the comment. You might wonder whether so-called already does the job. Well, it doesn't really do it. It gets a pretty accurate value for the comment paragraph, minus 0.6, because this is relatively critical here. It also says minus 2 to the describe paragraph. And that's we could see that as bad news. But on the other hand, description doesn't mean I'm neutral all the time, because bad things can happen in the movie. And when you describe the bad things happening, you have negative words. And therefore, so-called makes interesting distinctions, but it does not distinguish accurately between describe versus comment in movie reviews. It's a different exercise. And that prompted us to do some more work in this direction and figure out how the overall performance of so-called when applied to a movie review can be improved by paying more attention to these stages in the genre. So the stages classifier I talked about in the beginning, which says this is a formal zone, this is a describe, this is a comment, can now be fused with so-called to get more accurate results for the whole reviews. Two options, disregard the description paragraphs altogether. So you have the whole movie reviews, description paragraph here, and one more there, and you can basically ignore them when doing the semantic orientation calculation, and you want to know whether the review is on the whole positive or negative. Other option is to give it a lower weight than to the comment paragraphs. And we ran an evaluation of one particular data set, classified the paragraphs according to a described comment or formal zone, and then ran so-called in various versions. And what we see here is all sorts of different classifiers that I mentioned before. And on the x-axis, the weight on the describe paragraph. So here we don't change anything. The describe paragraph is just thrown into the text as any other paragraph. 
Zero says we ignore the described paragraphs for the semantic orientation calculation. We work only on the opinion comment paragraphs. And it turns out that the classifiers, the difference is not all that big. It goes from 77.7, which is the baseline, to 79, 9 point something. But there's a noticeable raise and then decline in the end, which suggests that we should downtone the described paragraphs, but not ignore them altogether when we want the best result for the overall text. So most of these classifiers improve performance over the baseline. And one indicator for the importance of this approach is that when you use the manual annotations of the stages with perfect comment, describe, or formal information, then performance goes up by 12%. So the precision of this describe comment classifier is really the key feature here. If we have a perfect classifier, then the overall semantic orientation becomes much better than before. Unfortunately, we can't have a perfect classifier, but still we had a respectable improvement in performance. But waiting is certainly better than just removing the described paragraphs because that's too risky. Okay, so that was subjectivity, taking a text and calculating how positive or negative is this text for a movie, for a product, for any question that you like. The next step then is to say, I don't just want to know whether something is good or bad, I want to know why, what reasons do people give for assigning positive or negative sentiment to something. And that can be done in social media, which have attracted the most attention lately in opinion mining, so you want to know questions like, why do people prefer one car over the other? What reasons do voters give? Why did they vote for a certain person? Or you could address the traditional media, which still have this multiplication function, and that's what we chose to start with. So we didn't do social media lately, but traditional media. For instance, in this summer, um, financial crisis looms in other parts of Europe, as you know. And one thing that was done is to outlaw it's called the empty sales. So if you don't own a share of Microsoft, you can't sell it anymore. Previously you could. You could bet on something that you didn't own. Now in some countries in Europe you can't anymore. And newspapers commented on that. Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? So you have different voices commenting on this particular move of our chancellor. Some bad, some not so good, some very positive. And it would be nice to see a what's the voice of the newspapers, and B, what are the reasons being given? Why do people like or dislike this particular move? One text that I will come back to a few times is Curing the Symptoms, which has a rather negative view on this move. It says right in the beginning, this decision seems not very convincing because the fact that four countries now outlaw this stock market deals demonstrates that Europe is not speaking with a single voice anymore. Then you concede something, okay, yeah, those Euro countries that are the target of speculators, Spain, Greece, Italy to some extent, uh, they should do that, that's okay, but nonetheless this move appears rather helpless because, and so on, and so forth. So arguments weighing the pros and cons, but in the end really conveying a negative attitude towards this move. We're actually not the first to try this kind of work. In the good old 1980s artificial, artificial intelligence tradition, there was one dissertation trying to do precisely this, focusing on the financial market with knowledge representation and everything. So there were semantic networks on costs and sales and how things were connected. Very elaborate analysis of argument networks. People are holding beliefs. Beliefs attack one another or support one another. Um, very nice, but it all relied on extensive manual knowledge representation. You have to have all this knowledge encoded in your system, otherwise you can't do anything. So that was highly domain-specific, and it's not the kind of work that we want to do now. Instead, we want domain-independent, but genre-specific work. We are interested only in um, commentary or editorials, but the approach we're developing should work across different domains. Right, having 
explain the notion of argument mining or the goal of argument mining and now turn to how to represent the structure of argument. What do we want in the end as a result of a text analysis when that text conveys an argument? Argumentation is to a good extent studied in philosophy, obviously, and one specialist is Eckhart Eggs in Germany, and he points out you can argue three things, basically. You can make an epistemic argument, which means you should believe some proposition or not. You can make a deontic argument, you should do something or not. Or an ethical or aesthetical argument, you should like or dislike something. That's about all we can argue for or against. Good, bad, or beautiful, ugly, on the one hand, do something or don't, or believe a proposition or don't believe it. And various genres of argumentative texts address different of these arguments. The mathematical proof is pretty much epistemic. It's not about beauty. <laughs> it's This follows from these premises. Scientific paper is, to a large extent, I guess, epistemic. Political discourse is often deontic. We should vote for somebody. We should vote against some law or whatever. Fundraising letters are certainly deontic. You should give your money to some agency letters to the editor are often ethical, aesthetical, that was not a good idea, and so on and so forth. And the genre that we focus on in Potsdam is commentary and editorial. We have a corpus of about 250 different argumentative texts from this particular genre, which in fact goes into different sub-genres. Um, as journalists know, commentary isn't like commentary. There's at least these five different types of commentary, ranging from long, extensive opinion articles all the way down to very short, tabloid-like commentaries, if you want to call them, rough statements of opinion, not very much argumentation proper. This is kind of a pamphlet thing that you find only in tabloid newspapers. The pro and contra, our subgenre of choice, is nice from the processing viewpoint because it has an, usually an interesting traceable argumentation. It takes a clear position. It weighs the pros and cons, but in the end says, hey, my thesis is yes or no. So you have to make a clear point, which is not the case in other types of commentary. You can just chew on the news for some time without taking a clear stance. So this subgenre then is in fact the most promising one to start with in this particular game. Remember, our goal is to do domain-independent and genre-specific text analysis. So what I'm presenting is, is, does this need power? What does it need? Hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, I complained about the battery. <laughs> So we're focusing on one particular subgenre with an eye on extending to other kinds of commentary, but we don't care what is being commented on. In that sense, domain independent. It can be the financial crisis, it can be our attitude towards animals or what have you, or building a new palace somewhere or not, and so on. Argumentation people take as a classic reference nowadays, or most of them do, the Toulmin scheme from 1958, which says an argument is whenever you conclude something from data on the basis of some general rule, a warrant. So you observe something, you conclude it because there's some general rule associating the data with the conclusion. This warrant can then, in terms, be backed by authority. It's written in the Bible, say, or in some important work in your subject area. And to make things more complicated, you can have rebuttals. So usually the conclusion follows from the data, but sometimes it doesn't because there's a counter-argument here. So the, unless the rebuttal says you have to get rid of this counter-argument in order for the conclusion to go through. And the last element is there might be a qualifier that says usually, mostly, generally, but not necessarily, definitely does the conclusion follow from the data. So that's nice, but that's not quite what we want, because if we have a text unfolding over time, we don't want to press the text into this individual scheme. We want to build up the representation for the text piecemeal. And there is a handful of notations that has been suggested for doing this kind of thing. Oops, now you can't see the lines, I'm afraid. 
Uh, one is by Grevendorf, who distinguishes four different scenarios. One, this is an arrow here, one supports two, so you want to claim this, and that's your support. You should go to Prague because it's a great city. This supports this. This blocks that one, so it's a counter-argument. You shouldn't go to Prague because Prague is always rainy in December. Might be a counter-argument, I don't know. One tries to support two, and three says, yes, that's good. I am the warrant. I am in favor of this relationship. So three doesn't support two, but supports the application of one supporting two. It's the general rule enabling this support. And the same thing happens here for the blocking case. One tries to support two, but three says, no, I'm blocking this. You can't do this in this particular instance. So there is some reason why this relationship shouldn't hold. And with these four elements, Grevendorf then arrives at diagrams like, again, all the lines missing. These guys are supporting one. Five and six are supporting four, which is a paraphrase of seven, so it's the same information. And they support eight, nine, and this thing attacks number one. So that is one way of drawing graphs representing the content, the abstract content of argumentative text. Here we have the lines. That's much better. You can't see the reference. Um, the approach that we finally adopted is by a philosopher called James Freeman, who distinguishes in a somewhat similar way, but slightly more elaborate on that end, four different elements of what can happen in an argument. This is the standard case. I'm supporting this one. Go to Prague because it's a great city. And this can multiply. You can have individual different reasons supporting the same thesis. And Freeman goes at length to distinguish this situation from that situation, where these two only collectively, they work together in supporting this thing. It's a big debate between what he calls modality versus um, this independent support relations. But it's not so important for our purposes here. Fourth case is this rebuttal thing. This guy wants to support this guy. Let's go to Prague because it's a great city. Oh, it's December. December is bad weather. Um, but in the end, you want to argue this point. So the counter-argument has to lose. And in order to make it lose, we need this thing up here. That's the counter-rebuttal. So this guy blocks this support relationship. And this one says, no, you are invalid in this example. Great city. Let's go to Prague. Bad weather in winter. But this year, it's quite acceptable. That would be the counter-counter argument. So in the end, we still have supported number four. OK, so that's the different things we need. And now these things can combine. So this goes there. You can have a sub-argumentation going on here. You can have more complex things here. And then the rebuttal attacking at the end. And then you can build up a tree of configurations from this alphabet, so to speak, that will give you a representation of the overall argument except for one thing that we had to add to the Freeman scheme, and that is borrowed from Gravendorf, the unless situation in Freeman's approach always has to block some specific support relationship. It has to say, you want to support that one, but I block precisely this thing. What does happen, on the other hand, in many commentaries is you have a counter-argument that is not attacking one support relation in particular, but a general counter-argument. For instance, I don't have that much money at the moment, so Let's reconsider going to Prague. Yeah, that would attack the conclusion without addressing one particular support. So we added that one to our representation scheme, annotated about 20 texts by now with this scheme from our corpus, and found that it pretty nicely mirrors what's going on in these pro and contra commentaries. With our curing the symptoms example, we have the main thesis at the beginning of the text. It's not very convincing. And then we have argumentation in favor. We have two rebuttals. Granted, it does make sense that especially those Euro countries that are the target of speculators now prohibit uncovered sales. You're conceding something here. You're conceding something there. But then you wipe these counter arguments off the table because in the end, you want to support that one. So that the structure in the end. Where's all my blue gone? The overall structure looks like this. Main thesis being supported by 3 and 10. 4 and 11 block these. And then there is counter-argumentation to wipe the rebuttals off the table. I'm not going through this in detail now, but uh, we can in the question period if you like to. Right, so that will be our target structure then for 
argumentative text and we are running experiments now to see whether this tree is in fact intersubjectively all right. Uh, experiments show that identifying the central thesis works quite nicely. That's fairly reliable. Whereas the overall tree drawing task is much more difficult. So people do not easily agree when given a text, please build up such a structure. It's a very complex task. And what we're doing right now is breaking it down into individual sub-steps. Um, that means incremental tree construction. We do self-paced reading. You see one segment. See, how does it attach to what I have? Aha. Uh -huh. Next segment. Think about it. How does it attach? Okay. Next segment. So we're constraining the annotation process in order to get higher agreement, but that's still, as I said, underway, so we don't have figures for that yet. Then the final portion, I illustrated the kind of structure that we want. question is, can we actually do that automatically, and if so, to what extent? And that's now the really tentative part where we have some intermediate results, but no, no, no system yet. One important part of related work in this business, then, is Simone Teufel's approach towards argumentative zoning, as she called it some 10 years ago already. What she did is take scientific papers and attach a label. Actually, they're all labeled. There's some colors missing. Every sentence gets a color, which indicates what's the function of this sentence for the overall text. And the labels say, what's the aim of the paper, what is the weakness that I'm conceding, what's my own method, what's my own result, what's my own concession. And there's a few more of these categories, in fact, which she arranged in a decision tree. The basic distinction is, is one sentence making a connection to other work in chemistry or computational linguistics or mechanical engineering, or is it a knowledge claim where I'm saying, I found that X. Connections, there's various subtypes, can support my own work, it can run counter my own work, I can build my work on others, that's use, and some others. The knowledge claim can be my own, or someone else's, or my future work. It's a three-way distinction here. And my own knowledge claim can be um, previous work or current work. If current work, then we have the goal statement. In this paper, we want to show that arguments are important. That will be aim. Or I can praise my own approach, or I can concede that there were some failures in my own work, I have to concede something uh, for my own work, own results, and own method. Failure is specific to chemistry, in fact. In computational linguistics papers, Simone didn't find own fail very much, but in chemistry it's important to report that if you tried these two chemicals, no, they didn't react, so I tried something else and then it worked. And it's important to record this fact because you don't want the others to replicate the failed experiment. So own fail is in chemistry not really very important, but still more important than in computational linguistics. There were two different schemes. That's the early one with, I think, seven categories, and AZ2 with the more complex set of categories that was then applied not only to computational linguistics, but also to chemistry to prove that this kind of approach can work across domains. The guidelines grow significantly. There's the corpus being annotated. The kappa, interestingly, stays the same when going from this scheme to that scheme, except that in Comblink it's a bit lower, and the automatic kappa that you can get is moderate, let's say. So it's, of course, a difficult task, but the automatic system that Simone developed got respectable results, I would say. What does that mean for our work? We don't want chemistry papers. We want pro and contra commentaries. But the situation is, in fact, very similar. We found that our commentaries consistently break down in an, into an inventory of these seven, eight different content zones, which come back from text to text. There might be an introduction, exposition of the problem. There's always the central thesis of the author, arguments, counter-arguments. Sometimes there's background information, if necessary. Sometimes an alternative proposal. You say you don't like the attitude of Angela Merkel for, towards this thing. She should rather do blah. That's the alternative proposal. And then often there is an upshot at the end, some sort of rhetorical finish for the whole text. So for the text you've seen twice by now, here's a zone analysis, thesis in the beginning, then pro-argument, argument of the opponent, that's a counter-argument towards your own position, 
you have here, and this has to be followed by a but or something, right? You grant something, but then you have to get rid of this counter argument with other green stuff. Here you concede something, the green stuff gets rid of it, and there's an alternative proposal at the end, which doesn't really evaluate the question whether you should, we should ban these empty sales or not, but makes an alternative suggestion what should really happen. And there is no upshot, no rhetorical finish. Yeah, so we have done this kind of zone annotation with students for six, seven years on many, many texts, and it's really stable that no more zones are needed. And on the other hand, all these zones keep showing up. There are certain regularities in terms of ordering. Lots of colors missing now, so I'm not going through this in detail. One difference to the Simon situation is that our inventory is much more evenly distributed across the text. In the chemistry and computational linguistics case, you had these two making up for almost half of the complete inventory. And then there's one more with 15%, and all the others are pretty rare. Whereas in the commentaries, we have a more even distribution, which is just a feature of the genre. So how can we ever recognize these zones automatically? Here are the features that Teufel and colleagues used. Many of them are well known for people who do text summarization. It's the old Edmondsonian position features, sentence length, position of sentence in section paragraph, type of headline. Does the sentence contain words from title or headlines? That's well known in summarization. The sentence contains important terms according to TF-IDF ranking. There's some syntax going on. Citations play an important role in scientific papers. When I cite other work, that's an important clue to the content zone that doesn't happen everywhere in the document. Then the history, the most likely previous zone, kind of a bigram zone approach, and some meta-discursive features, type of formulaic expressions. She distinguished 20, 28 different formulas. The agent who is doing something, is it the author or a third party or the reader? And then 28 different verb classes were being distinguished. For our own setting, many of these are not really relevant. We don't have sections, we don't have paragraphs, we don't have headlines in our short commentaries. What remains is position. Syntax is important for distinguishing my own claim from a mere statement of what's been the case in the world. History is certainly important. We've found some regularities in terms of zone um, co-occurrence. And verb class and negation also is potentially interesting. Okay, but zones are only the first step. In the end, we want these nice tree diagrams, which is a much bigger task. And now comes the really tentative part. Um, it's kind of the roadmap that we are approaching how to build these trees automatically. We see three kinds of information sources for doing that. The first is features of the segment itself, the illocutionary status, as we call it. What does the sentence or the segment in itself convey? Am I making a claim? Am I making a statement about the world? Am I saying something about my own attitude? That's this thing. Then there is linkage. How does the segment link to its context, the local coherence? And third, there must be some constraints on overall structure. It's not just a bottom-up process, but there are top-down expectations on what trees are good and what trees are bad. So for the first topic, I will briefly mention an annotation study and then our steps toward implementing this. The annotation study, here we borrowed from, which you can't see down here, work by a linguist called Peter Schmidt in Germany, who analyzed a lot of different genres of newspaper text. So newspaper, but then different subgenres, and came up with this inventory of elocution labels, which kind of a generalization of the speech act idea, but applied to monological text, which is kind of rare. No? Speech acts usually apply to dialogue, dialogue act theory. And he suggested do this for monologue as well. I'm not going through this um, in detail now. We did an annotation study here to find out, can this be annotated reliably on our corpus? The choice was to, you, to work with semi-naive annotators. We worked for this experiment deliberately with kind of untrained annotators that only had the written guidelines as their training material. So they read the annotation guidelines, 
relevant to the text. No discussion phase or anything, and under those circumstances, the kappa is, I guess, okay. In general, that's not considered okay, right? It's pretty bad, but it already, it really depends on the annotation scenario, whether you have intensive discussion with your annotators. And we want to test the quality of a written guideline, so to speak. Are they sufficient to make explicit what we want from the annotators? And, well, to some extent, they are, but this can be improved by having more intensive training, of course. Confusion matrix. Um, yeah, I don't want to belabor that at this point. Now, can we classify elocutions? Can we distinguish evaluation from non-evaluation? Evaluation is somebody uttering an opinion. So here's our curing the symptoms text. And now you might remember that's exactly what so Call was doing. Take a text and figure out whether it's positive or negative towards some question. So the evaluative portions here are snapshot, not very convincing, makes sense, not speaking with a single voice, solo attempts, naive, and so on and so forth. Some green, some red. And so-called doesn't, this is the intellectual analysis. What so-called does is it approximates this quite nicely. It misses a few things like lip services, it doesn't have any dictionary, but uh, it finds these items that are now in color or underlined, I'll explain it in a second. And the overall judgment by so-called is minus 1.2, which is pretty accurate. It's a negative attitude towards the overall question. So just a few examples. Convincing is positive, not makes it very convincing, intensifies it, and not then makes it negative. And the overall result is minus 2.4. Here's another intensifier, rather helpless, very bad value for that sentence. Um, easy to circumvent here, so-called is a bit misled. Easy sounds good, easy to circumvent. Well, this isn't all that positive in this context, but that's too complicated for so-called, right? So we see easy and end up with a one there. And there's more examples for negation and a realis marking here. It would be wrong to blame. Wrong and blame are pretty bad words, but we are canceling them out here to the wood, so that the minus one results just from the weak and the other ones. It averages over weak, big, and interests. Yeah, so so-called can be used to make a partial distinction here between evaluation and non-evaluation. For other elocutions, we have to do more linguistics, I think. We have to look at sentence mood. Subjunctive is important, and various kinds of closed-class lexical items, the modal verbs, epistemic adverbials, which are often used to signal that something is not a statement about the world, but just in the speaker's mind. Besides elocutionary status, the second important information source for building these graphs is the local coherence. Again, we did a little corpus annotation study, and then I talk about the lexical resource we have built up and then the pilot implementation that is running so far. Connectives, as some people in the room know them very well, what they do is explicitly link propositional material in the text, so you have different kinds of syntactic units fulfilling this function, conjunctions, certain adverbials, and propositions. There's more than you might expect. In German, there's 350, as one dictionary of connectives has found out. This is a very respectable resource for German connectives, published out a handbook of German connectives. They're discussing 350 of these guys. And the problem is that they are sometimes ambiguous in two different respects. A word can be a connective or not a connective in a reading, or it can signal different coherence relations in text. So den here is a coordinating conjunction in the sense of English for. Here it's just a question particle that has a zero translation in English, and you don't want to identify this as a connective which coherence relation, there will be an example in a second. Our corpus study focused on the causal connectives, which are for argumentation especially relevant. We took hotel reviews from one of these customer review sites. Average length is half a page. We took these because there is a high frequency of causal connectives to be expected. People advise other people on how nice this hotel was, whether others should go there or not. So there's arguing going on, but also description. 
I went to the pool because it was advertised as being great, so people describe what went on. They also argue and they motivate the others to go to that place or not to go to that place. There's a number of complications where I missed the English translation, sorry about that. We sometimes have multiple antecedents or consequences, so it's not just segment, connective segment, but you can have multiple antecedents because this, we did this, and we also did that. There's iterated connectives, this is the case because that and because that, which you want in the end in one of the same argumentative schema. You can have multiple connectives and relations in the same sentence. Due to the stinking garbage tons outside, and because the view was so atrocious, um, I can only disrecommend this particular room. So two causal connectives in one configuration. And the worst thing that can happen in German is you have multiple connectives but only one relation, the so-called correlates. I had a two-mate because I was 
pretty like uh, like uh, eighteen something. I was an expert in that at all. Yeah, but and I noticed it. My, my my question would actually uh, be to the knowledgeable audience. Do you know if this is also the case for the Czech word Makonets? Did it also just mean the temporal Makonets and not Grades where you have the negation 
Yeah. Uh-huh. 